Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Fabio, Director of Special Programs with Intrepid Corporation. I'm, and on behalf of the company, I'd like to thank you all for attending our webinar, Frontline Defense, Why Browsers Are the Biggest Vulnerability to Your Business. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our Chief Scientist for Passages, Lance Cottrell. Lance, I'm passing it over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Chris. We've been thinking a lot over the last well, almost 20 years about how to secure people's experience of the Internet. And we've been building tools uh, to enable our customers to do all sorts of uh, operational activities on the Internet against uh, extremely hostile opponents. And we've realized that the browser really is the crux of the vulnerabilities that we're seeing out there. And it's, it's the, the number one source of compromises on the Internet. And so we've been thinking about why is that and what can you do to protect yourself more effectively. So the first sort of data point that we look at is that 68% of all malware that you get, everything that you see, comes through the web. So there's lots of ways you could get malware. It could be by email. It could be by, you know, someone a chat message. Someone hands you a thumb drive. Lots of different kinds of vectors that could come up. But almost 70% of it is actually coming in through the web. But the more interesting data point is that over 90% of the undetected malware is delivered through the browser. And that came out in a couple of recent studies. So that means that it's actually much more difficult to detect the malware that's coming into your system that's, that's being sent to, to try to hack your networks when it's coming through the web as opposed to when it's coming in through one of these other channels. But of all applications in the world, the five most vulnerable applications in terms of number of major vulnerabilities discovered are all either browsers or browser plugins. And so this may be starting to give us a sense of why the browser is really the, the focus of all of these attacks. And it's not like they're not working hard to try to solve this problem. So in 2014, Internet Explorer had over 230 major security patches rolled out. Chrome had over 415. So they're working hard to, to catch these things, but it clearly is whack-a-mole. They keep finding more and more and more of these, and it's obviously not starting to uh, converge towards a good solution. So why the browser in particular? It's uniquely vulnerable for several reasons. So it's not just like any other tool. There's a lot of characteristics of browsers and the way we use them and the way they're built that leads to this set of problems that they have. And the first is quite simply that they're huge, enormously complex structures. So for example, Firefox has something like 13 million lines of code just in the core of Firefox. And it's got to do so many different things. There's an enormous number of file types that it needs to be able to support. It needs to be able to do different kinds of streaming. It's got to manage video. It's got to handle I.O. It's got to you know, deal with web sockets and all these different kinds of technologies that are core to the browser, any one of which could have some kind of a weakness or vulnerability. And if any of those happen, immediately it then exposes the user. Uh, to various kinds of breach, downloading a malware, take over the desktop, and then moving off into the rest of the system. But of course, it's not just the browser that's the problem. There's more moving pieces. For example, the plugins. Most of us have lots of plugins installed into the browser. So now you've got all kinds of other players which are adding attack surface and vulnerabilities to you. So you're installing things like Flash, you may be putting in search bars, social media helper tools, uh, YouTube video downloaders. Uh, think about the recent compromise that involved an application called Superfish. And the Superfish plugin was supposed to help with searches and optimizing uh, your, your web experience. But in fact, it installed a root certificate into your browser that would allow anyone to impersonate any website that you were visiting. So in fact, this little plugin, which people would put in without a second thought, thinking that it, it had nothing to do with their security posture, actually completely undermined the entire SSL 
uh, certificate infrastructure for any user who had it installed. And in fact, browsers run four Turing complete machines inside of them. So these are complete programming languages that can be used to do any kind of computation. Unlike HTML4 and earlier, HTML5 is capable of being a complete programming language and can execute arbitrary code. Java, obviously big programming language and the source of so, so many compromises that we've seen. They just seem to keep finding new ways for code to break out of the sandbox inside Java and impact the larger system. Of course, JavaScript is ubiquitous on all um, browsers, uh, and you really cannot even try to use the Internet uh, without JavaScript en enabled on your browser. So many websites now are AJAX-driven. They're dynamic. The content is being loaded in real time from the websites. So trying to turn that off isn't even an option. And then, of course, our good friend Flash, which seems to have uh, a never-ending bounty of new exploits being discovered against it. Uh, but again, one of those things that so many websites still depend on heavily, it's very difficult to just sort of choose to disable it completely. But yet, it gives this much larger attack surface uh, which people are able to continuously exploit. And you compare that to something like an email client, which has much less functionality. All it's doing is downloading messages in a known format with known types. It's not interactive. It's only talking to your server, not out to some server in the wild. Um, a much simpler kind of platform, much easier to secure. So what about existing security solutions? You might say, you know, why can't I use my firewall and anti-malware and tools like that to try to solve this problem on the detection and blocking side, you know, prevent these attacks from coming in against my browser? And again, the browser presents some fundamental problems when you're trying to implement security. So detection it's really turning into a failed approach. You know, even the folks at Symantec said antivirus is dead. The malware is able to be polymorphic. It's encrypted. It's obfuscating its presence. It, there's lots of tricks that the attackers can play to make it extremely difficult to spot the malware coming in. And of course, because browsers have to support this enormous range of file types, you can't simply just say, like you might an email, I'm going to exclude all executable files. You know, you can't mail someone an executable. Uh, you can't mail someone some sort of active content with the web. You have no idea what they might be doing. They may be trying to download and install software. They may be trying to view some video. They may be trying to play an online game. So the browser kind of has to assume, and the antivirus has to assume, that you intended to get what you got. And firewalls also have a real problem because they're designed to keep things out. Right? The whole original concept of firewalls is you design a server which doesn't allow inbound connections except the ones that you've explicitly sort of permitted to the servers that you've explicitly hardened and, and prepared for this. But a browser is going out. It's making connections out. And I kind of think of it like a vampire where they come in because you have to invite them in. So you go out to the website, you invent, invite the malware vampire into your house, and it bites you on the neck and takes you over and compromises your network. The firewall kind of has to assume that when your browser requests a particular URL, that you sitting at the keyboard, in fact, made that request. So it's very difficult for the firewall to know what's legitimate, what isn't, what just because some particular URL comes up, it doesn't know a priori whether or not it should be allowing that to happen or whether it should be blocking that kind of content. And there's some important trends as well that are driving the movement towards the browser being the dominant uh, vulnerability source uh, on the Internet. The first of which 
is a real move towards targeting of attacks. What we're seeing is that as we've gone from many years ago, the sort of amateur hackers who were doing it for fame, glory, and to count coup against some, some target, you know, maybe just to face the website, this is now big business. It's either being done for uh, commercial gain, money, or for political reasons, either through hacktivism or through nation state actors who have some particular political goal that they want to achieve, uh, you know, think Sony. So the attacks are much less often going to be like the old internet worm, you know, the Morris worm that tried to attack every single server it could find or malware that propagates out to every single person that you communicate with. You know, you're not gonna scrape someone's email account and email absolutely every single contact that they've got. Instead, they're moving more towards going after specific individual or small group targets with carefully crafted attack met methods. I think the most interesting example of this that we've seen recently was something called the Dark Hotel. And in the Dark Hotel attacks, uh, an advanced persistent threat group was found to have compromised a large number of hotels, primarily in Asia. And what they did was they compromised both the Wi-Fi servers and the reservation systems so that when a guest would check into the hotel, they'd check in, they'd, they'd get their room assignment, and when they went to log in, you, of course, the first thing you see at a hotel is a login screen that makes you type in your name and your room number. Well, the attackers, because they'd compromised the res reservation system, they knew when high-value, interesting targets were coming in. And when that person logged into the Wi-Fi and they could recognize them by name and room number, they would automatically launch an attack that used you know, a, a poorly defended exploit, I'm not sure if it was actually a zero day at the time, to install malware right at that point on the target machines, but no one else. And the reason these guys are doing this sort of thing is they want to avoid detection. As soon as they get seen, as soon as a system administrator knows that an attack's going on, they know that some of their servers have been compromised, then the wheels of response start to turn. Suddenly you're looking at what are the signatures of this attack? What are the behavior profiles of this attack? What other computers might have uh, been exposed to this kind of malware? Uh, you're gonna start remediating. You're gonna start locking down your systems. Vendors will start patching the vulnerability that you're using. So the longer the attacker can avoid detection, the more effective they'll be, the longer they can maintain their presence in the network. So if they can uh, target just a very small number of users within a company, they're much less likely to set off anomaly detectors and other kinds of uh, attack detection technologies than if they'd sort of run amok and tried to go after everyone in the company or indeed everyone in the world. The other piece is that these exploits that you're using, particularly the zero-day exploits, are not cheap and they're not common. You may be spending five or six figures to buy a zero-day exploit in the open market. And this is really an active, robust open market. Right. The people who are writing the exploits, the people who are packaging them, and the people who are using them are typically totally different groups, and they're all just paying each other. But you know, these are really magical, special, and very expensive commodities. And so once you've gotten your hands on a zero day, it's really important that you don't get it burned quickly because it's expensive to get another one. And in fact, there may not be another good one appropriate to your target coming along anytime soon. Uh, Fortunately, I suppose for us, uh, really good exploits don't grow on trees. So they want to make sure that they don't attract attention, not just from their particular target organization, but from anyone who might then start building signatures and identifiers to, uh, in, to make their zero-day attack no longer zero-day, a known attack, a discoverable attack, and something that's easily blocked by you know, existing anti-malware tools. And of course, by carefully targeting who you're going after, you're avoiding the honeypots and the spiders that security researchers are sending out all over the internet, 
looking for these kinds of attacks and malware, trying to get attacked by the bad guys so that they can, as quickly as possible, identify the attack and start building the countermeasures. And finally, targeted attacks turn out to be just generally more effective because they look friendly and familiar. Someone's taken the time to carefully craft the website, the email, the message, uh, the context within which you will see the link to click on the download to be something that is familiar, friendly, uh, something that you as a user are expecting to see. And therefore, you're much more likely to click on a link, accept a download, execute the, the, the file once it gets to your computer than if it had just come out of the blue. Right? An, un an untargeted attack would be the Nigerian print scam. As soon as it comes in, you know that this is bogus. You know that it's not someone you really know. Whereas if you've just gotten home from a conference and you get an email from someone who, in fact, saw your talk and wants to talk with you about the tool that they've built that's relevant to what you're talking about, and they reference some story you told, and they include an attachment, the odds of you're opening it are really high. I firmly believe that there is no one who is going to be able to resist a really sophisticated, targeted attack like that, particularly you know, targeted spear phishing type attack uh, over any length of time. They might get lucky, but they're going to fall pretty quickly. So the next big trend we're seeing is exactly in those phishing uh, messages. And the trend we're seeing is that phishing attacks in email are moving from delivering files directly to delivering links to files and links to websites. And so we're thinking, why, why would attackers do that? Why do they want to, they've already sent you an email. Why not deliver the malware directly in that email? Why take an extra step and send people to a website? And the answer fundamentally is that email scanning and filtering actually works pretty well. You've got everything going through a nice central pinch point. It's all going through a single server. That server can sit down and analyze the messages. It can look at the attachments. And because this is not a real-time protocol, it's a store and forward, it can take the time to unzip things and go through layers of compression, uh, possibly run the content in some sort of virtual machine, try to detonate it, try to see what's going on, and you can set up policies fairly easily to just say, nope, there cannot be any executable content that comes in through uh, the mail filter. So it may not be perfect, but it's actually pretty effective compared to what you can do on the web. Conversely, testing URLs in an email turns out to be a much harder problem. So now it's no longer a local phenomenon. You can't run everything just on your server. You need to go outbound. You need to actually connect out to whatever web server is listed in the URL. That web server may be responding slowly. That web server could be running SSL, so now you've got to set up secure communications with it. Once you connect to that URL, as is often the case with URLs and emails, there may be several levels of redirection. So just because you've managed to hit the initial page, you may now need to go fetch the next page and the next page. And each page you go to might have many, many elements. You know, modern web pages may have upwards of 100 different little moving pieces on it, uh, often from multiple different source domains. So you've got the text, you've got all the bits of graphics, you've got web bugs of various sorts and embeds and iframes, and they may be coming from all sorts of different locations. It may be active content. So this all may be pulled down by Ajax or Flash or something else. And a smart attacker can design this so that it's those active components that actually deliver the malware. So your per email system trying to scan to say, is this an okay URL is having a really hard time working out, is this something I should be letting through? So in general, all the emails with URLs just get through. Now, the really clever attacker can actually combine this. They can do a targeted phishing email with a targeted website. So now, not only are they making sure that the message is crafted, but they can set up the malware on the website so that it doesn't detonate unless you're the right target. In particular, they can make sure that it doesn't actually try to infect 
if you look like you're a malware scanner, some sort of a server that's, that's looking at all the emails that are coming in. If you don't match the profile of who they're trying to hit with a real web browser, uh, you know, with cookies and, and history and all that hair that you see on real browsers as opposed to on uh, you know, automated scanning systems, then you're not going to launch it. So you can limit how many attacks you're making. Again, staying below the radar of the uh, detection. Um, you're not going to hit IP addresses except the target you want. You can avoid the bots, and you can even avoid virtual machines, which are identifiable, because often the attackers know that security researchers do a lot of their work in VMs. So by simply not detonating in a VM, they can avoid detection and go on to effectively attack the real user who's sitting at their physical desktop. And these attacks through the web usually come through drive-by downloads because that's turned out to be a very effective way of getting the malware onto the user. And this is where a lot of those vulnerabilities in the browsers come in because using these sets of techniques, they can get the browser typically with no user interaction to download that file onto the local machine and then try to execute it. Even if there is user interaction, it's often disguised with some sort of pop over or pop under that kind of can hide the button itself or through appropriate social engineering, convince the user that they really did want to click that link and get that download. But certainly the most dangerous is the cases where there's no user interaction at all. As soon as you see that page come up, as soon as that banner ad loads in the corner of the page, no other clicking involved, suddenly your browser volunteers to be infected, downloads the file, executes it, and owns your computer. We're also seeing a big move towards watering hole attacks. And this is the technique whereby rather than trying to reach out and attack your targets individually, where you're sending an email to each one of the people that you're trying to infect, uh, you set up camp where they're going to come to you. The analogy is that if you're a hunter, rather than trying to go through the jungle to find your quarry, what you want to do is you just want to set up in a blind by the watering hole because eventually all animals in the world come by the watering hole. And so the key then in the cyber realm is to set up your watering hole where your kinds of animals are coming by. So if you're looking for someone in the marketing department, you want to compromise a marketing website or set up a marketing appearing website. If you're going after their developers, you may want to compromise um, you know, some sort of a developer site, a Stack Overflow kind of website. And then you're going to get developers from whatever kind of company. Um, we actually have seen that all sorts of places, but this is still pretty untargeted. You know, you're getting broad classes of people, but you're not necessarily getting the specific people that you want to get. And so the next evolution of this trend, which is coming on now, is what we call the sniper at the watering hole. And the analogy that I use for this is if you're at the watering hole and you're just machine gunning every animal that walks by or, you know, setting up, you know, uh, setting up landmines all the way around the watering hole to catch anyone who comes in, two things are going to happen. You're mostly going to catch targets that you're not that interested in. And, of course, you're going to attract a huge amount of attention and scare off everyone else. So you're going to violate that principle of trying to avoid detection in the first place and preserving your valuable zero-day exploit. So instead, you set up a watering hole where your target's likely to come by but then you sit silently until the white rhino shows up, right? That, that super valuable target, that's the thing you actually want to get. And then and only then do you launch your exploit against that person and compromise their machine. So you're not falling for those spiders that are looking at every single website. And you know, it's very easy to sign up for these services. It will scan your website to see if you've been compromised. They look to see if they get malware, to see if they get anything surprising downloaded to them. That works unless the, the system is designed to never try to infect those spiders because they're not the target you're looking for. They're not that white rhino. In that case, the website never knows it's been compromised. We actually saw this fairly recently with a compromise on Forbes.com. And someone went in and managed to compromise the server that, sh that loads up the message of the day on Forbes. Forbes is a fairly broad Website is not a highly targeted selection for your watering hole. But then they set up their system 
to only attack U.S. Department of Defense users and Chinese dissidents, which is pretty suggestive of who may be launching this attack, but certainly not guaranteed. Uh, but it was a long time before this was detected because all the standard security methodologies, the security researchers, you know, someone would say, we think we got this uh, malware coming in from this particular source. But when the researcher went there to confirm that, they never saw anything. So it really slowed the whole process down. So I see someone uh, was just asking if you'd be safer if you ran virtual machines. Um, I think you're actually a little bit ahead of me here. Uh, so let's, let's now move on to talking a little bit about what kind of new approaches you can take to try to protect yourself against these attackers. So philosophically, when we look at the problem, the first key is minimize the damage. Right? You know you're gonna get affected. You know you're gonna have people uh, successfully compromising uh, your, your browser. How do you keep that then from spreading out? Because typically the attackers want to land on your computer and then pivot to attack your databases, your domain controllers, usernames, passwords, uh, electronic medical records, credit card and debit card information, you know, whatever, whatever other things they can get. The more you can contain that damage, the more effective you're gonna be. So the first big principle is containment. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that that malware doesn't spread out beyond the initial landing point to go after other capabilities within your company. You don't want them to be able to go after that domain controller or any other device or any other computer. You want to make sure that once it lands, and it's going to land at some, at some level because the browsers are vulnerable, that you contain that to as small a box as you possibly can so that it doesn't cause major damage. The next step is you want to automate your recovery. So let's take it as given that your browser is going to be compromised and it's sort of laid waste with malware and, and hostile, uh, hostile code. You need to make sure that on a continuous basis, automatically, without user intervention, without having to send out an IT guy to fix the, the computer, to re-image the laptop, what have you, you want to be getting back to your known, good, clean, pristine state. And you want to automate this process because you can't count on even knowing if you've been infected, right? These guys are coming in with clever zero days. They're coming in with polymorphic attacks. So you have to assume basically on a continual basis that you may have been compromised in some way that you don't know about and make sure that uh, the repairs are happening in the background without user intervention. Um, you know, it needs to be almost instantaneous. It needs to be frequent. It needs to happen automatically. And it needs to ensure that it happens in a way that malware can't persist, right? There's no point in shutting down and restarting, say, a virtual machine if it restarts with all the malware still in place and happily going about its business. It's really important to make sure that you're destroying all of the hostile content in that small box that you've managed to contain the malware in so that when you start up again, it's not able to even continue operating inside that small box. You now have a nice, clean, empty box. We think that isolation is really key to that maintenance of the box, and there's two parts to that. It's isolating the browser from the computer. So making sure that the malware that comes into the browser, you know, something that's exploiting the browser code, getting memory resident or getting on the, the local drive, can't then go off and infect the whole computer. It can't read your files. It can't read your contact list. It can't operate your email. Um, it can't go out and try to attack other parts of, of your system and get at the data that you really care about, the stuff that's data at rest on your systems. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you're isolating it from the network. Because even if you can compete, com keep the attack from accessing the PC, we're all living in this halo of other devices. So if you're sitting at the office, you've got your single sign-on servers, you've got your mail servers, you've got your domain controllers, and you've got systems that no one bothers to patch. You've got the printer, the, the fax machine, the Nest thermostat in the corner, you know, all of these devices that probably get no love from IT, but are in general full computing devices that have web interfaces that could be attacked. So I can just run 
uh, JavaScript on your computer that will discover your non-routable IP space and then start automatically trying to connect to well-known ports on every device in that local Class C and try to automatically compromise it. And that's even without exploiting the browser. That's just by running JavaScript to send different queries that the browser is happily you know, popping off in the background in some hidden iframe. And the last technique is camouflage. And this is one that we don't see other people talking about almost at all. But uh, the idea is that with this targeting, people are trying to profile you. They're trying to look at who you are, do you meet the kind of person they want to attack, either as a group, as an organization, or as an individual? But this opens up this jujitsu move where you can use this technique against them. So if you can arrange to not look like who they're targeting, then their exploit won't launch. Right? So if people are trying to, you know, if this shepherd is trying to you know, hunt wolves, and you're a wolf, it behooves you to look like the sheep because the sheep are kind of uninteresting. Sheep are everywhere. So if you can look like a sheep, you can operate on the Internet without anything happening. And as uh, Rick was pointing out in his question, if you can, in fact, look like a security researcher, that's a huge win. Right? If you're running in a virtual machine, if you're running in a clean system, then you look like someone that the attacker definitely doesn't want to launch the attack against because it's extremely likely to lead to rapid detection and you know, dis destruction of the value of their zero day and you know, cause things to get patched and get the uh, defenders all spun up and starting to work on this problem. My Kung Fu use teacher used to say that the best way to block a punch is not to be there, you know, to take a step back, to dodge. I think in cyber defense, the best defense is when the attacker never even attacks in the first place. And so this is really the thinking that led us to develop the new Passages Secure Virtual Browser uh, that we're going to be debuting at, at RSA. And it really was the experience that we've had building tools uh, for people to go out on the line online in situations where they were guaranteed to be attacked, you know, going and looking at very bad people in very bad places, uh, taught us a lot about how to engineer these things. And so when we wanted to roll out a secure browsing platform, really as much as for ourselves as anyone else, you know, we, we thought about needing a standard browser so it's easy to use because any security tool that uh, changes the way people work and requires them to uh, change their workflow significantly, people are just going to work around it. And so when you're building a response, it's important not to inconvenience your users too much or they'll bypass your security and then who knows what they're doing. You want to be using a disposable virtual machine. So spin up your browser inside a VM, which at the end of every session gets blown away. And you can't just use sort of standard VMs. You need to spend a lot of time optimizing it. They should be hardened and you need to make sure that there's no communication with a local machine at all. No shared folders, no shared files, uh, no way of communicating uh, tasks or actions back and forth directly between the local operating system and the virtualized operating system. You want to be using a VPN for network isolation so that all the traffic from the browser goes only over an encrypted pipe to a point outside your secure perimeter so that the malware that's running in that VM or in memory because uh, it's compromised the browser, it can't spider your other devices. It can't see the printer, the nest, the, the database, the domain controller. That's all completely hidden. Hide the identity so that you can avoid those attacks. And the VPN can buy you that as well as long as you don't own the endpoint. In our case, all of our customers share a small number of exit points so they all appear to be interchangeable with each other. So that gives you this large crowd to hide in. So we've got a big flock of people that look a lot like sheep. And then, of course, you need to have this manageable. You're never going to roll this out if it's not to a large scale. So making sure you've got uh, enterprise class deployments, uh, monitoring, and reporting so you can keep track of what your users are doing. And that's, that's really the tool that we've built is based on that set of, of risks and our understanding of the browser as really the core vulnerability that people are facing right now, building out a tool that kind of automates 
all of the capabilities necessary to launch an effective defense. So I'd like to open it up to any questions. Um, you can ask right here in the questions uh, section, or I encourage you to reach out to me directly. Uh, you can get information on this product at getpassages.com. We're going to be at RSA, so we'd love to see you at our booth, booth 727 in the South Hall. You can email me, follow me on Twitter, and I blog about all things privacy and security at theprivacyblog.com. So great, I see we're getting a couple of questions popping in. Uh, one, user, one of you is asking uh, why, uh, if you already use a VM, do you need something like this? Uh, virtualization is really useful, and uh, particularly a lot of people are using VDIs these days. Um, unfortunately, VDIs uh, and virtualizations as they're generally used don't provide much protection because if that is your day-to-day -day desktop, then it is as compromisable as a normal desktop would be. And if it's got access to all your files, your email, you know, um, your Salesforce accounts, what have you, then compromising the VDI would be the same as compromising your local desktop if you were using the local desktop. So it really is important to make sure that it's just the browser. And then, of course, you know, when you're building it for just the browser, you can do a lot more hardening because you don't need to support a full desktop and all the other kinds of applications that might be there. You can narrow it down to be just the single tool set that you've got. And in fact, for us, our virtual machine runs Linux because it's easier to harden uh, in a very serious way. But also, just from an ecosystem point of view, the vast majority of exploits are written against Windows. Of the ones that aren't against Windows, they're almost all against Mac. There's a tiny handful from Android, you know, a, a, a tiny number against iOS, and just a vanishingly small number that are actually launched against uh, Linux-based platforms. So when you're visiting a site or you're opening a file, the chances that that file is actually going to be able to execute against our platform are vanishingly small. And even so, then we've got our security in depth of virtualization and all those other uh, isolation of the machine and the network uh, to keep things from coming in. Let's see, we've got a couple of other questions here. Go back to that. So how do you find the product? Uh, if you go to our website at uh, getpassages.com, we've got all the information about how Passages works. It goes into much more technical and detail than uh, I've given here. Um, and we'll give you an opportunity to, uh, to sign up, in fact, to get uh, a test and you know, be able to kick the tires on your own. So the way we've done this, and it, it's, uh, the, the next question is, how easily can we have Windows run a virtual machine in which we run a browser? And can you switch from regular work to the browser and its container? You can do it yourself. So uh, on my Mac, I have virtual machines that are running Windows, and I could fire that up go into that desktop, launch the browser, use the browser, and then move back and forth. But you really want them more integrated. So even though uh, Passages is running in a full virtual machine, uh, we've actually hidden all of the interface except the browser. So when you double click on the Passages link, it actually just looks like a browser window pops up with tabs. You can have multiple windows, but it really hides all the hair underneath. But you can certainly, if you're a, a power user, if you're an expert in these things, um, set up your own virtual machine, you know, uh, using uh, VMware Fusion, for example, and configure it to allow you to then run the browser in that and roll back, right? So you, you'd want, as soon as you run it, to, to set a checkpoint so that it uh, has a saved state that you can roll back to at the end of every uh, use. And then, of course, you need to be really careful about maintaining that. So when there's a patch, you need to start it fresh, patch it, Recheck, checkpoint it, and then you can roll back to that new kind of safe, safe state. Someone's asking about what the uh, latency is that we see uh, because we're using a VM and a VPN. One of the nice things is when you run the virtual machine locally as opposed to VDI, uh, you basically have near zero latency. Uh, everything's actually executing right there on your machine. So even if you're on a somewhat questionable uh, internet connection, uh, videos and things like that will run cleanly. Uh, the VPN introduces a very, very small uh, incremental latency and bandwidth restriction, but uh, we've had no trouble downloading large ISO files and streaming high definition movies uh, over the system, which is something that really breaks down when you're trying to 
uh, do things with a remote desktop environment if you have anything but a really stellar internet connection. So I'm just asking, how does this work with Anonymizer? In many ways, this would replace Anonymizer, which is a, a, a consumer privacy service uh, which VPNs your, your traffic out. Uh, Anonymizer VPNs all of the traffic from the user's machine out to the internet and hides the source IP address. Uh, with passages, it is focused just on the browser, so it's only protecting your browser activity. Uh, however, that VPN comes out of the same kind of exit points that Anonymizer does, so you get the same kind of anonymity there. But because we're burning the browser to the ground at the end of every session and recreating the entire virtual machine from scratch, it automatically wipes out absolutely any tracking information inside the browser so that uh, Cookies are deleted, but of course you can delete standard cookies, but all kinds of super cookies, flash uh, objects, things like that, all get eliminated as well. It also deals with tracking using browser fingerprints, which are an incredibly powerful tool for uh, identifying user. It turns out that if you look at all of the visible information about your browser and plugins and fonts and, and, and so forth, you're uniquely identifiable, whereas all passages users look the same. So you are indistinguishable from any other passages user. And because we'll have a very large number of users of the system, the fact that you're a passages user provides almost no information whatsoever. Someone's asking if this is available for uh, consumers uh, as well as businesses. So at the moment, uh, because we're just rolling it out now, we're selling just to uh, corporate users just to businesses with, uh, you know, multiple seat accounts. And that's just so that we can manage the growth, uh, make sure that we could do some hand-holding and uh, ensure a really good user experience. Uh, once we've got a large number of users on board and some real track record and running this over time, uh, our plan is to be rolling this out on a much broader basis. Um, we're not quite ready to talk about the pricing. We'll be rolling out pricing information at RSA, but I think it's uh, going to be very affordable for people. All right, well, if there aren't any other questions, thank you very, very much for, uh, for listening to this talk, and I hope I'll see some or all of you at, uh, at our booth at RSA. Thank you.